to Mind Escape. Are you ready? Are you ready to escape your mind? All right, folks, welcome back to Mike and Maurice's Mind Escape. We have episode number 304 tonight. I am joined by special guest, Jose Maria Barrera, and uh, his new book is out, which is called Dendra, Temple of Time. I highly recommend it. Uh, I've got this thing right here. It's a beast of a book. The imagery um, from the temple of uh, hathor at dendra is is unmatched if you're if you don't if you love egypt and you don't get this book you're missing out because I, I really i've read hundreds of books since i've been doing this podcast and by far the coolest book in terms of images and symbology and all that kind of stuff so i highly highly recommend it so go check that out i have the link at the bottom uh i have also jose's website you can go check out and yeah I, I, we're going to have an excellent conversation on this. Um, if you want to support Mind Escape, the best way to do it is just to click the link tree link down below. We've got tons of you know episodes from that we've done recently, um, kind of a little bit of everything from uh, you know the cannabis residue found at Tel Arad, uh, which is an ancient site in Israel. Uh, you know, you name it. We've done talked about my near death experience on a recent episode. Um, so we've got lots of cool stuff, so go check that out. And, um, yeah, look forward to uh, our conversation here tonight. So welcome on the show, Jose. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. Like I said, I uh, shout out to Inner Traditions. They sent me a copy, and I'm telling you, this this is a nice book. It's, it's a beautiful book. Um, how long did it take you to make? So the actual project, the idea started like probably like six years ago, seven years ago. Uh, but the actual project of the book, I went to Egypt to take the photos for the book in 2001. And I finished the book probably like, like a year ago or something like that. So it was like two and a half, three years writing the book, creating, like recomposing the ceiling in one big image and, and so on so it was like two and a half three years of work a lot of work let me tell you <laughs> uh, you can tell rewarding. i mean you could tell it was definitely a passion project of yours because like i said it just it it looks great it's got great information in there um like i said just an all-around awesome book and i mean it's a nice change of pace too because i'm either listening to audible or holding you know a uh, a paperback book or whatever and this is just something kind of different and i like mixing it up so um yeah, so i think the, <clears throat> the people from inner traditions like they they made a great work on on the polishing of the quality and to me that was the most important thing about the book was the quality because the whole book is all the the, the photos of the ceiling at the at the proneos of the temple of dendra and the thing that I didn't compromise at all and I really wanted was like good quality printing on the book so the images look nice, right? Like to like make, make a tribute to the ceiling. So I, I want to cheer for, for Inner Traditions because they did a great job on that. Yeah, sorry, I my thing was it took it, I hit the button and it didn't unmute right away. Um, why don't you give us a little bit of a background on kind of how you got into this and you know, do you have any connection to this professionally or is this just a passion? Like a little bit of your backstory. Hey, yeah, so yeah, this is one of those things that twenty years ago or thirty, like say twenty years ago, I would have never thought that I would do. I'm a computer designer, basically a software designer by, by trade. And 
these became like a passion of mine like probably like six years ago i i ended up going to egypt with my family my wife and my two daughters and i fell in love with this place when we were there and and i didn't expect to find so much beauty and, and such a beautiful place and in such a pristine condition because the one of the beauties of this temple is that it looks like new so it's probably one of the best preserved uh, temples in, in in egypt or structures in egypt and yeah as you can see in, in the photo that you're showing there is massive like look at the, the the size of the person at the door of the temple so it's like seven stories high and this place is complete like the roof is complete the carvings are complete like the 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 colors on their ceiling are the original colors and they were restored like probably like uh, 10 years ago or in the last decade mm, so this place is incredible because you go to the Parthenon or you go to Ephesus or you go to a Roman Forum and you have to kind of imagine what the temples and the structures were there because what you find is ruins and certain columns and certain walls but the rest of the structure is up to your imagination at this place the temple is as if it was finished yesterday uh, so it's fantastic because the mood of the temple is still preserved there and in contrast with other temples in in egypt like if you go to luxor and you go to the temple of luxor temple of karnak those temples even though they're like in very good shape they're not completed right like the the, the the ceilings are missing things like that so so they feel like ruins but this temple in particular feels like new and that's something outstanding because it's a 2000 year old structure but it looks like new mm. yeah no it's uh again your book kind of breaks it all down now one thing um in terms of like symbology and stuff like that we've talked about like schwaller Dulubitz a little bit in the past mm -hmm. um temple of man is this kind of the opposite almost like a feminine temple or like a temple for the feminine or something like that because oh, yeah. um and, and can you describe kind of what you think was happening ritualistically and like what the symbolism depicts mm -hmm. so to give some context to people uh, and i don't know how acquainted your your audience is with with ancient egypt and in particular with this temple so i'm going to try to give like a summary of what the temple is and, and so this temple is dedicated to the goddess hathor the goddess hathor the image that represents the goddess hathor is the cow and hathor is a very ancient pre-dynastic uh, goddess it's probably one of the oldest deities in egypt and it survived for six thousand years or something like that and she is the goddess of fertility so this temple is a completely feminine temple and that's something that is very interesting right like when when you go to different temples in egypt they have different moods different vibes and when you walk into the temples you feel this like you you feel like like you are connected or 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 not with the temple and it is very hard to describe but mm, there are some temples that are like for example the temple of, of the consort of, of hathor uh, that is in the south and it's more more to the south of of, of egypt is the temple of edfu uh, that temple which is another temple in pristine condition beautiful uh, those temples they have the pylons at the entrance and you have images of war at the entrance they're like like they're masculine temples and they're uh, gods beheading people and beheading the enemies and things like that on the walls of the temple mm. so i think this so, is edfu right here and then that that could be or that's probably one of the staircases in in dendra so De uh, so i have dendra i think this one's edfu that's what i was going to pull up is they're actually pretty similar that's one of the um yeah so 
Let me one, one, one of the things that happens with these temples is that these are, well, one, one thing is Egyptians were, ancient Egyptians were incredibly conservative. See, that's so from look, Dendra right there. That, that's how similar they are. Yeah. yeah, it's hard to tell what, what they're, they're incredibly similar. And, and what I was saying is that these temples are, or ancient Egyptians were incredibly conservative. So if you look at our 6,000 years old or 5,000 or 4,000 or the styles of the hieroglyphs, for example, as time went by, they introduced more symbols in, the, in their alphabet, but the style remained the same. And, and you see these images, like all, all the, the, the effigies that they, they, they represented and all the figures, they're always looking in, like in, in portrait, like on sideways. And, and the style is very consistent along the whole history of, of, of Egypt. So many of these temples are very similar and the structure of the temples is very similar. And they were highly conservative. Like, like they, 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 they preserve the style for like thousands of years. Uh, now this temple, is a late temple, as I mentioned before. is is one of the last temples that were built in Egypt before the the society went uh, declined and, and ended right in ancient Egypt. So this temple uh, was built at the time when basically at the Ptolemaic uh, period, uh, right at the end of, of the, the ancient Egyptian civilization, and when the Romans were coming into into Egypt and were conquering Egypt. And this temple was constructed or the begin the, the construction of this temple is from the year I think is fifty two or fifty four BC is when it started to be built. And it was the the construction was started by the father of Cleopatra. And two years after he started the construction of the temple he died and Cleopatra became the last pharaoh of Egypt. And she was the one who built the rest of the main structure of the temple. And it took like 33 years to finish this structure until she was killed, right? Like, and, and then the proneus, which is the front where the columns are, like the image that you have behind you, and it's like the front of the temple. Oh, yeah, that, that map was perfect. The map you were showing, like the diagram of the day. Yeah. So the bottom is the 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 bottom that you see there is that room with the and the squares are columns there are 24 columns on that on that room is the the image that you have behind you and that's the proneus of the temple and on the top like like right at the center like where you see like that uh, n like the, right at the center of the temple that's the holy of holies of the temple so that's the inner the most inner part of the temple and these temples were built like onions from the inside out. So the first thing that they built is the inner chapel, that is that where the statue of the deity resided. And then they start to build the rooms around. And, and so it's like an onion and they start to build it. And then at the end, if you see the, 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 the big room at the, at, the, at the bottom, the Proneus, that was added afterwards. And that was finished like in the year 130 AC or something like that. Mm. So, so these temples were like, they were long time projects. And this one took like a century and a half to be built and completed. Mm. And, but as I mentioned, this is at the end of the, of the Egyptian, uh, ancient Egypt, mm. which has advantages. And one of the advantages is that the accumulation of knowledge in this temple is like for like this is a summary a recount of all the knowledge of ancient egypt in this temple mm, in particular in the ceiling of the of the of this room of the proneus what you have is a celestial uh, uh, depiction so it's panels that represent the sky basically with celestial images and most of the astronomical knowledge of Egypt is encoded on the ceiling. 
and because it's a late temple and it's already the the Greeks have been there for 300 years and, and then at the end the Romans and before the Syrians conquer uh, Egypt so there is this infusion of knowledge and, and astronomy in particular from Greece and, and, and Babylon in the ceiling. So one of the interesting things about this ceiling that you find is the signs of the zodiac, the constellations of the zodiac are depicted on the ceiling with the traditional images that, that we know. So Scorpio and Leo and uh, Taurus and Capricorn and so on with the traditional images, but what is beautiful about them, and then we can go into them uh, uh, later, is that they are stylized to the Egyptian taste. So they're recognizable, completely recognizable. You walk in and it's obvious that you are walking underneath the constellations of the zodiac, but they are stylized and adopted, uh, adapted to the Egyptian uh, uh, aesthetic. So it is quite remarkable and the colors are intact because the ceiling was cleaned in the last decade and is that where the astrology or the zodiac came from was the ptolemaic period was it influenced from greece or did egypt already have that going on there uh, so astrology is mostly babylonic right and and it ended up in egypt right and then you have in in, in greece and you have greek astrology and so on but but the origins of astrology are babylonic and and then later on they they made up because of the Greeks in, in in Egypt, then Egyptians started to adopt astrology as well. Mm. Now, what is interesting is that this difference that we have today between astronomy and astrology, that's a new concept. In the past, astrology and astronomy were just one thing and the same, right? And when you look at the ceiling, you see astrology and you see astronomy and you see religion and you see the gods and so is this we 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 have segmented knowledge in in, in the present and we have specializations and the, the astronomers and the astronomers don't know anything about religion and the the priests don't know anything about astronomy and so on and so forth but as you go back in time uh, one advantage I, I would say that they had is that they have this unified field of knowledge where everything was in harmony with everything else. And that's something super interesting about, about ancient civilizations. And I think it's very hard for a Western modern mind to try to crack these things because we have a very rational mind and, and we are looking for literal things and if, if you if you think about it, our science and the way we attain knowledge today is by creating precision in our knowledge, in our language. In like when you look at mathematics or you look at uh, philosophy or science, uh, what you have is very technical language where you're trying to describe things very precisely in one way, right? Very rational, very one one meaning. Uh, but when you go to the past. Uh, people used to tell tales and myths and allegories that encoded knowledge in symbols. And these symbols are not, they, they don't have only one way to be represented or understood, but the beauty of symbols is that they can capture, they're a, 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 net, a net that is cast wide and, and you, can, you can encompass a lot of things in poetry, for example, that you could never encompass in in mathematical language. Now, that doesn't mean that they didn't know about mathematics and that they didn't know about measurement and things like that. They obviously did because look at the structures that they created. And in order to do that, you have to be formal and you have to have formal knowledge, right? And, and you have to be rational, but it doesn't mean that is the only way to know. And Today, we have forgotten that there are other ways to think about the world and to see the world. And we only look at the world today through the eyes of reason. And, and so when, you, when you're confronted with symbolism or allegory, it's very hard to understand it when your only tool is, is the rational. No, oh, well said. I mean, that's something we've tried to do on this show is kind of analyze things, obviously, 
from a philosophical but also scientific while also walking the line between woo and uh you know like you said rational logic you know that kind of stuff so um i think though when you look at some of these ancient cultures like you said they did it in such a smooth way that it, there was no I mean, I don't know. There maybe there was people that you know would fight, go back and forth about it back then too, obviously. But for the most part, it just seems like the depictions, like you said, it just they fit well. And like our understanding, I think, of mythology is that, or when, at least when I've heard most like Egyptologists talk about the mythology, except for who I will mention, who wrote the foreword for your book, Bob Breyer, uh, he did a great courses. Um, lecture series on Audible. I highly recommend it. It's very, very good. Um, and he goes through kind of like the primordial gods and tries to explain all the, you know, the nuances of everything. And I, I just thought it was really well done. Um, but for mo for other, you know, when you see people talking about ancient Egypt, whether it be a temple or a mummy they found or whatever, um, you know, I just, I get the sense that like, obviously it's not in their, it's not on their priority list to try to understand the spiritual or the metaphysical aspects of what they're looking at, you know? Yeah, it's because it's very hard to explain that if you, you only use reason. And um, so, so one thing that happens today is that when, when you look through the eyes of uh, the West, you look back at the past, a lot of people think that the these primitive people were superstitious and and i bet like just like today there are a lot of superstition in the past because we haven't changed much in in the last six thousand years but uh, i think that's a very narrow-minded way to look at the past mm, because just because we don't understand what we see it doesn't mean that it doesn't make sense or that it's superstitious. And I try my book, in my book, I, I make a big effort to try to show the merits of what they were doing and to show that it wasn't superstitious. It was perfectly, it made sense what they were doing. And they were very advanced in many ways. And it has to be because look at the magnificent structures that they left so they had to have very deep knowledge into nature and into many things in order to be able to create these wonders yeah absolutely um and i think i think with egypt it doesn't it just seem like and anybody i talk to about uh, or talk about with ancient Egypt, it's like there's a, a level of mystery there that's not, it's not there anywhere else. I mean, kind of with some aspects of ancient Greece and maybe a little bit, um, you know, obviously I think there's a lot of mystery surrounding like a Gobekli Tepe or some of the aspects of the Sumerians and things like that. But when we get down to it, uh, I think Egypt probably evokes the most mystery in people or invokes um oh absolutely absolutely so and, and i think the reason for that and the, so i think is 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 multi, there are multiple reasons for that but I, I think the first one is that there is so much in egypt so so they left so much legacy there and there are so many things that were left there that you go to their cultures and it's hard to find as much archaeology in anywhere else like this is probably the richest legacy that we have from from the past is egypt like you see the amount of mummies that they have taken out of egypt and and that's a three percent of what they have in egypt it's like and, and what has not been excavated as well so so it's incredible the amount of, of stuff that these people created it was a great culture mm, and i think the other thing that happened is that humanity forgot how to read the hieroglyphs and so that creates this aura of mystery on top of it because for 2000 years we forgot how to read hieroglyphs so it you you find these wonderful structures covered in decipher undecipherable symbols and and that 
creates wonders, right? To the imagination, that's tantalizing. And, and you end up creating all these lore and all these myths and all, they were aliens and all these things that is the imagination goes wild trying to find explanations of the unknown. And and you can see like in in the, I think it's in the, in the 1600s or something, there was a guy called Athanasius uh, Kishner, which I think is the first guy who tried to decipher hieroglyphs. And he just made up crap. Like he just made up what he thought oh, this means, and he just created like free uh, association of symbols, and and and, and people thought thought that the the hieroglyphs were just like pictorial, like like ideograms, like like Chinese. And one of the big things that took a lot of time to to people to learn again to decipher hieroglyphs is that they thought they were ideograms, so. They thought that the way to read them was just like telling a story and the figures when you saw a lion, it was a lion. And then if the lion was on, on the side of the sun, that meant, oh, this is a bright lion or whatever it is that they, so because yeah. they were trying to associate and, and they never, they, they didn't expect it to be that to be phonetic. Mm. So that was one of the things that took like, like took astray people trying to, to decipher them because they were trying and ideograms is incredibly difficult. And because they are not abstract at all, like you look at the hieroglyphs and they're animals and plants and utensils and people and gods, then it looks like it looks like a comic book. But it's natural that the first thing that you want to do is to try to read it like a comic book. Mm. And but that's not the case. Now, when you look at the images of gods and, and depictions of gods and their crowns and the position of their hands and, and uh, what they're wearing and, and what they hold on their hands and so, so on, that's a language. So that's symbolic. So, so when you see a god that has the head of a lion, say, so you see Sekhmet, it doesn't mean that in the past, the Egyptians believed that there was a god with the head of a lioness. That's a symbol for what lions represent, majesty and force and bravery and so on and so forth. Mm. So in that case, it's symbolic, right? And, and that's another misconception that we have. We think, oh, they were superstitious. They believe in gods with heads of animals. And even movies, like, that, that's, I mean, it's beautiful, right? Like, Hollywood has created all these movies, like, what, they, what is the, the one with the portal, with MacGyver, what was the name? And they have a bunch of oh, movies yeah, yeah. Where, where they open portals and the gods come and then they have the heads of lions and so on. And it's like yeah. the aliens that come through the portals <laughs> and so on. So Like Stargate or whatever. Yeah, Stargate, yeah. So, no, but so, but you're you're right though. But so, um, well, we've talked a lot about. We did like a episode a while back. And I even clipped the part where I'm talking, telling the story of the Rosetta Stone because you're talking about um, deciphering the hieroglyphs. And until they, you know, Champollion um, and all that, you didn't have. Um, you had a lot more mystique and mystery, kind of to your point about. Uh, people reading it and seeing like all these images, they thought it was like way more alchemical and way more um, mysterious than it actually was. And then you get somebody who's been reading and studying books his whole life that understands Coptic and and all that. And then they start to slowly break down and see what everything's saying. And then, you know, the Rosetta Stone was discovered, I think in 1799 by Napoleon's uh, army. And then it went back Mm -hmm. and forth between Britain and France. And then, um, yeah, and then you have Champollion, and who was the other guy? I forget. I always forget his name because he's not as important. Salt, I think he is. Yeah. And the British, the British guy, I think. He, yeah, yeah. He was a scientist. Salt, he was like a ph- yeah, physicist. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so I mean that that story in itself is super interesting, and it's like how you know that's how we rediscovered the past in a way, and now it's like now let's figure what we just figured out and start applying it to everything. And now you, there you have modern day uh, Egyptology or the Correct. beginning of it. Now there is a caveat on that, right? And it's one thing is to be able to read a language, which is what 
what we learned when we deciphered the, the hieroglyphs, right? But something very different is to understand what it means. So, and especially because the style they use is, is like a poetic style of allegory, right? And they're talking about, oh, when the god uh, uh, raises, is raising the horizon and blah, blah, blah. you don't know if they're talking about planets or they're talking about like the context of what they are saying is missing in the text. So you read all, you read all these things and yeah, you can understand the words, what they're saying, but what they are alluding to is very elusive because we, we lack the context. And, and the other thing that happens is that many of the, of the knowledge in ancient Egypt was a secret in the sense that the, these were initiatory sects and, and a lot of the knowledge was not written down but was passed from the master, the high priest to the lower priest and so on. And it was just stayed there in an oral way and it was never put down, right? Like, in, in, so this means this, they, they don't do that. So, so it's very interesting because we read the end result, but all the context and, and, and what it really means is, is very elusive because we lack that. And, and I think a lot of that uh, he's gone forever. Yeah, I mean, was... I, sometimes, so like, I think language has a massive hand in consciousness in the way we perceive the world, obviously, because that's the way we communicate, that's the way we think about symbols and ideas and things like that. Um, I mean, to get into the mindset of ancient Egypt, you would have to like immerse yourself in like only hieroglyphs and only, um, you know, go that way in my opinion because how else there's no way to even connect to this culture i mean i know people that go there you're in awe you can probably talk a little bit about that but you know being there and stuff like that but um <clears throat> did, when you're there does it feel that much foreign not only do you speak a different language but you speak a different language that nobody understood for even two thousand years or so right yeah, it's a very strange place when you go there mm, because, well, Egypt today is a, it's very poor. It's a poor country. And it, it's, it's this big paradox because it's a country that is Muslim and is a conservative country when it comes to religion. And Islam is monotheistic, obviously, and is absolutist. Like, the only thing that Islam recognizes is Islam. Uh, and the creation of images and imagery and creating images of gods and things like that is, is a sin. It's like, you, you cannot do that, right? Like, so, so, so there is a lot of iconoclasm in, in Islam in general. Um, but the funny thing about Egypt is that because Egyptians, they live of the tourism and they live of this, of the ancient Egyptian culture, and they're very proud of their, of their legacy and their traditions. Mm. Then what is fascinating is that you walk around Egypt and it's covered with modern depictions of the ancient Egyptian gods, even though it's a Muslim country. So, but you see more, like, you see more <laughs> images of, 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 like, if you didn't know anything, right? Like, say, say tomorrow you erase the knowledge that we have of Egypt and you just went there and you saw that you, you would say, oh, they, they still worship the ancient Egyptian gods, right? Because they're everywhere. Because that's the, the bread and butter of, of Egypt today. A big part of their economy is tourism and, and, and this. So, so it's this paradoxical thing, and for for a Westerner, is is very shocking when you go there because ancient Egypt, and and that's one of the things that made me hesitate before I I ever show an interest in studying Egypt, is that it's so foreign to what we know, even though 
a lot of what we have today comes from there, but it's been filtered through the Greek eyes and so on, that then the Western eyes, right? It's been westernized. Uh, that is very foreign and very alien. So, so you look at all these gods with strange names and straight, strange faces and the hieroglyphs, and at face time, it looks impenetrable. It's like it's so foreign and so alien from, from what we know that is is mysterious in many ways. And one thing that you feel when you go to Egypt is you feel very small. And I think it's by design because you go like, just like the image that you have behind you of this temple, the size of this temple. So just proportion wise, when you're at the presence of the pyramids of one of these temples are gigantic. Yeah, look at that person at the door of that temple. You feel tiny. And it's not only that, but when you look at this foreign culture and this imagery that you don't understand and the language on the walls that you're totally illiterate of, then you feel intellectually small as well because you feel inadequate and you feel ignorant. So so the smallest, like the, 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 the size that you feel tiny is not only physical, but intellectually as well because you are beholding this big mystery, this big unknown, and, and you feel very inadequate, very, but at the same time, I think that's what captures the imagination of people and, and what creates the, attracting, the, the attractiveness of Egypt. So it's very interesting, it's this paradoxical thing. The other thing that is absolutely wonderful and beautiful about Egypt is that once you get acquainted with the symbology and, and their symbols and their culture, the, the ancient Egyptian culture, you realize that that culture could only happen in Egypt. Because just like looking at the hieroglyphs, what you have is the hieroglyphs are the animals and the plants of the Nile. So it's beautiful because ancient Egypt, the ancient Egyptian culture is an autochthonous culture that grew up out of the Nile and all their myths and all their legends and all their imagery and so on is depictions of the Nile and the cycles of the Nile and the day to day of the life around the Nile river and the desert and the animals there. And then the walls of the temples are painted and drawn and sculpted with the animals that you see around and, and the plants and so on. So it's beautiful because it is so organic. It's such an organic culture that could only happen because of the situation and the moment where it happened. And, and it makes it unique and beautiful because of that. It's sublime because it's the, style, the stylization in culture and symbols of the nature that surrounded these very astute ancient Egyptian, ancient Egyptian people. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of the symbolism, I think we were talking earlier about like Temple of Manchwal or Lubitz, symbology. What do you think that the temple represents? And then also ritualistically, what do you think was happening there? Okay, cool. So as I was mentioning before, the Temple of uh, Hathor, is the temple of the goddess of fertility and love and music. Uh, so she was, that was the main, the main role of, of Hathor. Mm, so this temple is a temple of fertility. And the temple itself represents, you can see the temple as a womb. Like if you show the, the, the image again of the temple, please. Can you show the, the diagram of the, of the... Yeah, I got it right here. The blueprint of the temple, yeah. So you could imagine that if you look at this temple, this is the feminine reproductive organ and the main entrance, right? You could, you could see it as the vagina and as you enter into the, into the heart of the temple, that's the womb where the statue of the goddess lives, right? So it's a temple of fertility. And then what they used to do, they, 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 the statue used to live right in the heart of the temple. 
and a couple of times a year they used to take it to the roof of the ceiling and there are two staircases one on each side of the temple and they used to take it to 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 the ceiling and the consort of the goddess Hathor, the husband, was a uh, Horus of Edfu, and they used to consummate their love in the in, and he is the sun, basically the the sun sunlight. So they used to take the statue of the goddess to the roof to receive the the, the light the light of the sun and consecrate the and consummate the 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 union of of the feminine and the masculine. So that's one 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 aspect of the symbolism in architecture of the temple. Uh, the other one, and what the book concentrates on, or the, the book talks about, is the main the main focus of the book is the ceiling on on the pronaeus, as I mentioned before, the room that you have at the lower part of, of this. Mm, and that ceiling, as I mentioned, is an astronomical ceiling, and what you have there is different depictions of different astronomical cycles and the reason why the book the subtitle of the book is the temple of time and in a way it was like honoring short short Lewis, like the temple of man i thought oh this is the temple of time well that's why and i asked reason, that i'm like that's perfect because you yeah. know it fits and and the reason is that this ceiling is a ceiling of time it is a map of time and the way it's represented is that for ancient egyptians time was not linear as it is for us but time was cyclical time happened in cycles and the obvious cycles like the day and night or the month the lunations during the month the phases of the month or the year and so on so each of the panels represents different frequencies of different cycles and the whole ceiling is a ceiling of the entirety of existence in time from the main axis of the ceiling that represents the present to the sides of the of the ceiling where what you have is the goddess nut that is the sky and is the black sky where the immovable stars are and that what that represents that's the lowest frequency of the cycles that is eternity because eternity if you think about it when the frequency is almost none when things are static then you reach eternity if you are measuring time in frequency and then as the frequency starts to go faster and faster and the cycles are faster the vibration of the frequency is faster the present is the highest vibration that is right at the center of the of the ceiling where what you have is the nexus between the celestial and earth and is the time on earth it's like the present the present happens and goes and goes and goes and forever and then as you go to extremes and then when you look at the sky then what you're looking at is eternity so this is a map of time of the whole existence of time from the present to eternity on the sides and that's what the, the the ceiling represents, and that's why I call this the Temple of Time. Yeah, no, it's per, it's perfect. Um, do you? Okay, so when we're talking about um, the cycles of time and things like that, do you think that there was multiple things happening in there too? So we mentioned. Um, the fertility rituals and stuff like that. You mentioned the Holy of Holies. Does the Holy of Holies vary in ancient Egypt? That's something I don't know because like we would just did an episode where we were talking about how they found um, cannabis residue at Tel Arad, which is like a super old, even, you know, early Judaic temple where they had the Holy of Holies where there was, this, you know, God had a, a wife at that point because there was two, um, uh, like little standing stones kind of a thing. Um, mm -hmm. And that's obviously where that ritualistic entheogen use happened. And there was some sort of, maybe they were communing with the God or whatever. We're talking about fertility, which maybe that's a different communion with the God, obviously. But like, is that's what I'm asking is like, is there one uniform thing that happens? Does it happen from temple to temple? It just, you know, it's 
difference you know differentiates between this god and that god or like how does that work so i think the 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 themes across the different temples are the same in the sense that the existential worry or the existential theme of the egyptians was and think about this they their sustenance it was an agricultural society and their sustenance came from what they could extract from the banks of the nile after the flooding and there was a flooding every year the nile river flooded the banks and as the water receded what you had was the most that creates the most fertile land in the world that is the banks but it's it's, it's a contradiction right because is you are creating the most fertile land in the middle of one of the harshest deserts in the world so is there is this stark contrast and literally when you go there you can stand with one foot on a side that is completely green and the other foot on land that is completely dead and it's just like dead soil right like sand and and you can literally i'm not exaggerating you can do that you and and you look at the aerial images of, of egypt and you can see the line is the perfect line on the sides of the river between the desert and the greenland it's like is and so so imagine this imagine that during the year as the flooding comes the water goes out and then as the water recedes the plants and the, the, the land gets fertile and then the green grows and as the as the river dries out again during the year then that green area starts to contract and 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 the death of the desert starts to eat up the green part so so if you could speed that up and you could see it like in fast motion what you would see is that the green area around the, 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 the Nile, right, expands and contracts and expands and contracts and so on. And their life depended on this because if they didn't plant at the right time or if there was too much flooding or not too much water and so on, then they had bad years or good years. So being able to measure how much water they would have and so they could prepare for next years and so on, was of radical importance and, and the most important thing and the existential angst in, in Egypt was when was the flooding of the Nile coming because the whole culture and the whole societal activity revolved around that. So a lot of the myths are about this and is the myths that they have are the cycles, the existential cycles that they have. So the death and resurrection of Osiris can be seen, right, as the as the flooding of the Nile, for example. It's one of the of the yeah. No, I, I know who did have. we we had um, Robert Schneiker on recently, who's a geophysicist, who he's kind of mm -hmm. you know he has a theory on the dating of the Sphinx, um, and he was showing us in, uh, images of the Nileometer, which kind of records the levels of the Nile kind of what you're talking about and he said that that was his favorite structure uh when he went to Egypt um probably aside from the Sphinx but um to your point and isn't that what the thought is now like within people you know talking about like building the pyramids is that when the flooding would happen or the rainy season the skilled laborers or farmers would then go to work on the pyramid or something along those lines it, it is exactly it is the whole like so so when when the when the river floods the land then all the arable land is useless until the water goes out so all the people who work on the fields are idle for close to six months because basically the banks are flooded and they cannot work so so the current theory and you're right is that the construction of big infrastructure happening at this time of the year. So, so, but then if you think about it, all the movement of people across the land, right? And because they were going to the places of where the temples were, the pyramids and so on to build, 
and, and, and this movement of people in the year happen because of the Nile. So, so then what is beautiful is that just as was I saying before, that this culture could only happen in the middle of, of that place, the, the activity of the people was totally dependent on and, and tied to the movements of the river mm, and the natural cycles of, of the environment. Mm, and so, so, so the activities of the people were synchronized with the cycles of, of nature. And then the role of the priests and the role of, of the temples or one of the roles of the temples, there were observatories where they used to look at the stars to try to predict these natural cycles. And then what the priests used to do, observing the sky, the sky and the, the regularity of the movements of the constellations and the stars and so on, is that they created calendars. And on the calendars, they had rituals and, and they have festivals across the year that dictate what the different societal activities have to happen at what point during the year. So, yeah, the time of harvest or the time of planting or the time of going and constructing structures and so on and so forth. So, what the priests are, they are a pacemaker. They're the, ones that, the, the, the guys that mark the tempo of the society. So it is in harmony, it is harmonious with the cycles of time. And the way they do this is by measuring the regularities of the movements of the stars in the sky. So it's beautiful because for a society to be successful, it has to be in harmony with, with its environment. And I think the secret of why a society like this one, like the ancient Egypt lasted so long is because they, managed to fine tune their society in very good harmony or almost perfect harmony with their environment. Uh, mention, you were mentioning the nilometer. Uh, for people that know, the nilometer is a way to measure the amount of water of the Nile. So during the year, it was like, imagine a well with a scale on the side and then the water of the Nile came into the, into the well. And as the Nile flooded, the water went up and they could measure how much water was coming in or going out as the, the water came up or down. And with that, this is, this is one of the fascinating things. They use that measurement to calibrate how much taxes would they charge people during the year because if that year they didn't have too much water, it meant that, well, the crops are going to be meager and they're not going to have that many, that many wealth. Or if there was too much water, then the flooding was catastrophic as well. So if they charge too much taxes on people who are starving, then they would have revolts and so on. And, and think about how advanced that is. They were using the river as an economic indicator to levy taxes. And that's fascinating. It's, it's way more complex than the scale of the IRS. That is, regardless if it's a good year or bad year, you pay 30% because you are from here to here, right? Like it's, it's way more advanced and it's completely organic and tied to the water of the river, which is fascinating. Yeah, that is kind of crazy if you think about it. And so, you know, that's the other thing, the perception of these people, too, is like, you know, I, I hear people talk about like, oh, the pyramids, they don't know how they did it, you know, so much harder, but then they won't give them credit for like other things. Like these were people just like us. They just might not have had te the technology that we do now, you know, like the, the actual technology. But I mean in terms of like evolution and evolution of consciousness and stuff it's we're not we're not that far you know they're this they're us basically oh absolutely and and in many aspects they were more advanced than we are like 
the, the things that in we have in tune with the phones, earth and the night sky, all correct, that stuff. Yeah, correct. That we we what what have we done to the night sky? We polluted it. Like what have we done to nature? We polluted it. So are we that wise after all? Like we're destroying planet Earth, right? In, in our endeavor to to progress, but can we call that progress? Uh, I don't know if we can last six thousand years like they did, right? Like so, there is a lot that we can learn from them. The the other thing that is interesting and is to see how correlated the Nile and and the and the the rhythm of the flooding of the Nile was how influential it was on on the on the on ancient Egypt is that the different dynastic periods that you have in Egypt and is when when they have these dynasties of of uh, pharaohs that were successful and so on and they made a lot of wealth and so on and then they have these intermediate periods that is what is called between long dynasties and these intermediate pe- uh, periods are times of revolt and civil wars and struggle see people and so invading on. all that kind of stuff Invading, see, see people. Yeah, invading. see people. And, see people did did a number on Egypt at one point. Oh yeah, uh, that that's one. But the other is these moments where the society was in crisis. Usually, so the the, the flooding of the Nile happened once a year, very regularly, and the amount of water was very regular. The Nile is re- very regular. Not anymore because. Uh, we dam the, the Nile, so so the flooding doesn't doesn't have an impact these days because all the water stays in Lake Lake Nasser, and they can control how much water goes downwards. But at the time, then what happened is that because it was very regular, but the years or times where it was irregular, like for twenty or thirty years, not too much water came down, or too much water came down, or it was longer than expected or so on. And these periods where the water was insufficient and irregular are tied very closely to these intermediate periods uh, between the, the, the stability of the dynasties. So the lack of water creates hunger. Hunger creates uh, unhappiness among people. Unhappiness among people creates revolts or you see, yeah i mean you see it even on smaller scales on some of the more ancient island civilizations like the moai on easter island or you know just depleting their own resources until what's left kind of a thing and then they start attacking each other uh same thing i there's no consensus on malta but i know we've had laura who's the megalith hunter you know she runs the megalith hunter channel and she lives on malta um, and they have kind of this intermediate period thing happening there too, um, which I find interesting. And then I assume it correlates kind of what you're talking about, like loss of water, or loss of resources, things like that. So Egypt's probably lucky in the sense that it's more geographically friendly, if you will. Like you're not on an island, so you kind of can go out a little bit. But yeah, I mean... <clears throat> to your point, I think you're you're spot on with the intermediate period thing, and um, it's almost like the Dark Ages for Egypt. Yeah, absolutely. And and the other thing that happens is that, so if you have poor economies, right, then you cannot have good standing armies, and then you're more vulnerable to invade inv- invasions from the outside and and so on. So so the whole stability of, and this is something that we we think today that we have superseded with our technology nature right that we have overridden the laws of nature and we can do whatever we want and if we don't like that that mountain in front of us we can just put dynamite on that on that and and that's what we do by the way look at the roads that we create is we don't like that mountain okay let's drill a freaking hole through the mountain and let's dynamite the mountain and that's what we do right like like we go over nature and we no, use yeah, we're, force we're, we think we're, to impose our will over nature. We think we're badass, we though. Forget, we forget how how mighty, like when, when there are tornadoes or earthquakes or things like that, those are little reminders of how mighty like, the power and powerful nature is. And we're just little ants on this rock and and 
we should treat with more respect the oh absolutely nature, right? I, I mean all it takes is a super volcano or you know god forbid like tsunami something crazy you know some astronomical body coming yeah. down doing damage <laughs> um yeah i think i think we're lucky we've gotten as far as we have to be honest with you without any sort of you know like a lake toba event or something along those lines but yep. um so <clears throat> back to to the temple um when we look at their their recording of time how how is that recorded like obviously you show the depictions of your book is there a way you can break it down without showing kind of you know what was recorded on that ceiling in the oh yeah we we can and if you want to, I can, I can show the ceiling. Oh, actually, yeah. Can you pull that? I'll pull it up on the screen if you can pull that the the thing up on your end, the the ceiling. Yeah, I'll pull it up on the screen here. Make it this little thing. Here, let me pull yeah. that up. Yeah, here. I'll take us off here. There we go. Cool. So. This ceiling, like this is the image that I recall. So, so I went to a temple to that gigantic room that you saw be, behind uh, Mike, and I took 5,000 photos of the ceiling with uh, a professional camera and a tripod. And then I stitched together all these 5,000 high resolution images and I created one grandiose image of the whole ceiling, which is what you see here. The squares. Do you see my cursor right away, or like the whole thing? Yeah, yeah, we can see your here? we can see your cursor. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So these squares that you see here, and there are twenty four. Those are the columns that support the ceiling. And then this ceiling is probably the size of two tennis courts, and it's seven stories high. So it's, it's enormous, and so the main entrance of the ceiling is here. And this is like the axis of the of the ceiling. If you remember the diagram that, that Mike was showing you, this is the room at the bottom of that diagram. And and this is the ceiling. So this is the main axis of the of the ceiling. And here is where all the traffic uh, on the on the, the that of the people that went in and out the temple went through. And then what you have is three panels on the east and three panels on the west. Now the east represents the day and life and the night represents, uh, the West represents the night and death. And there's a reason for that is that the sun rises on the East and sets on the West. So allegorically, the, the sun is born on the East and dies on the West. And they took this, this allegory uh, to the extreme in Egypt and on the west side of the of the river, they have all the like burial sites. They're always on the west bank because the west is the side of death. And the word westing means dying, right? It's, that's that's what it, it means. Mm, so so the, the ceiling is split in two halves, the day half and the night half. And then on each side, there are three panels and Basically, what I was explaining before, the central panel is the present, and then as you go to the extremes of the of the of the temple, like if you look at this, look at this, it's beautiful. This is the body. Like if you let me put it sideways so we can see more of that. One of the sides. It's beautiful. So this one here. So if I come here, you can see. Here is the goddess Nut. You can see her body and she arches over the earth and she represents the sky. So look at her body and it's beautiful, looks like water because they thought that the, the sky was like the Nile River and the stars and the sun used to use a boat to traverse and to go through the sky. So, so that's why all the different planets and uh, stars are on boats because they're navigating on the night sky on the near you know, the nile of the night basically and then so as you can see her body the goddess nude the goddess of the sky right represents eternity because this is the firmament 
the black background where there is no movement. Mm. And then in the center, what you have is all the earthly activity, right? And that's where the corridor, so it, architecturally, is symbolically, this is represented, right? Like structurally, is the same way, right? Like the, the the place where you have the least traffic on the on the on the on this room, obviously, is on the on the on the sides, right? Because there is no, and the main traffic goes here. So this is the highest frequency. This is the present. And by, by the way, when you look at this, you have all these solar discs with wings. They represent the sun across the the, the sky, and they represent the pharaoh. So the Pharaoh was God or Horus incarnated. So the Pharaoh was the nexus, the connection between the earthly and the divine and, and the, the beings in the sky, the gods in the sky. Uh, so this is the, the connection between heaven and earth, basically the, the realm of the divine and the mundane. So mm -hmm. what, how... Did you have to get special permission to take these photos like this, or um, did you do it just freely while you were just on tour there? Or like, how did that go down? So basically, when when you go to these temples, they sell you a special permit. That is, if you like, you can you can take photos with your cell phone, but if they see that you have a camera, then you have to buy at the entrance of the temple. You buy a ticket that is to use a camera there and that's what i use right basically i use the the permit that they what sell did there. you what kind of my my cousin who's my co-host he's not on every episode but he's he's a photographer and he's probably going to ask me so can you tell us what kind of camera you used for this yeah i use a sony alpha okay it's like a 56 megapixels per image kind of thing cool so it's a, a, a professional camera and then uh, uh, a tele lens that is like the ones that they use on 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 football games, like in in in, in sports. Nice, nice. To get close-ups. Uh, now with the advantage that the ceiling doesn't move, so I was able to put it on a tripod and then take long exposures because the light is not like the best. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you if you did long exposures too. Yeah, that's what I was curious. Yeah, 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 and, and different exposures, and then. Uh, I use a lot of like image processing in order to come up with the light has to be end up being like the same, right? So there are two limitations and or two complications when you're taking these photos. And is that so I, I spent three days from the moment where they open the, the, the temple to the moment that they close it. That is like they open at eight in the morning and they close like at four or five. Uh, and I went there like for three days straight and I didn't have lunch or anything because I wanted just to take photos. And I took 5,000 photos. So I was like just moving my tripod around and taking photos and photos and photos. And, but think about this, as the day goes by, then the sun goes from east to west. So the lighting on the temple changes. Right. So that's why you so need like had... light, light room or something to. And, and yeah. then once you start to stitch these images, you have to start like, compensating for differences in, in light during the day, right? And then the other one is that, because this was like a manual process with a tripod, then when you stitch the images, they they don't get like totally straight, like you can see them here, but they end up like being like deformed, right? Like no, I mean, I think you did a great job. I mean, I, if you didn't tell me, <clears throat> I mean, if I didn't know that there was pillars there, that there's no way to actually make it look like that without doing what you did i wouldn't know oh yeah absolutely because you have the columns in between right so you you have to walk around and 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 i mean that's, that's what i'm saying that I, I, that's what's so cool about your book is like the fact that you did that like there's no way to see that without either being there but even being there you still have the column so you what you did was super cool yeah, yeah, it was a lot of work. <laughs> so go, going back to, to to the ceiling, so the central panel is the present, and then as you start to go to the sides, what you have is different cycles of time. So I'm going to explain one for you so, so you can see my, what I mean by that. 
So let's take this one that is the first panel on the east. Mm. So what you have here is the cycle of the sun during the day from the morning, from sun, sunrise to sunset. And that happens every day. So it's the, the daily cycle of the sun. And the way they represented it is quite remarkable. It's remarkable. And is that they have 12 boats. You can see one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. And each boat, they, it represents an hour of the day. And the day was they divided in 12 hours on the day and 12 hours on the night. And actually, the division on 40, 24 hours of, of the day, that comes from the Egyptians. That's one of the of the uh, one of the legacies that we have from them is is the division of the day in twenty four hours. So at each hour of the day, like the first hour in the morning, what you have is the sun is in inside this disc, right? And it's like a child, and you can see he's suckling his thumb. And as you start to go. And the, the day advances, right? Like he's still suckling his thumb here. And as the day starts to advance, here's like there's a, there's a sphinx with the face of a bird coming out of a lotus flower, uh, which is basically they thought that life came out of the lotus. Those lotuses, the lotus flowers open in the morning with the sunset with the sunrise uh, and, and and as the day goes by and the sun starts to go up in the sky then here is like a teenager and with the face of a ram so this is a symbol of virility right of potency and then this is a young adult and then at noon is a ram so this is when the the, the sun is in the highest point uh, of the sky then they represented it as a ram with four heads. Why four heads? Because it represents each of the cardinal points, the four cardinal points. So this is the highest point of the sun in the sky. And a ram, why a ram? Because the, the ram, as I mentioned before, is a sign of potency. So a ram with four heads is the highest potency that you can have. And that's what I meant by symbolism in all these gods. It's not that they believe that in, in an, a ram, a god that was a ram with four heads, right? This is a, a, a representation of the sun at its highest point where it's the most potent. And then once you start to look at the gods in that way, then you realize that what they are is a symbolic language. And each of the heads and the crowns and the animals that they use are representations of attributes associated with the different animals and figures that, that they had. And then as the day advances, you have the other the six. So at this point is the highest point of the sun in the sky. And the sun has been rising up to here. And from this point on, the, the sun starts to decline in the sky towards the west. Mm. And it comes and you can see, so now it's like uh, an adult here. And as you start to come towards the end of the day, then you can see there is a mummy in the front of the of the boat foreseeing basically the death of the sun. And in the last hour of the day, look, the sun is depicted as an ancient guy with a cane. And that's the moment where the sun is on its weakest point before sunset, before it dies, to start the next cycle the morning after. So I mean, that's what I mean. That how beautiful. What, I mean, like, you, nobody's making shit like this today <laughs> in modern oh. times for, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, maybe, yeah, but like, this is just, this is beautiful. I mean, just the symbolism is just, you know, unparalleled. Yeah. And, and, and look at the colors. The colors are origi original. And this is not only painted, this is carved. So, so imagine the amount of work. So that, that that's what I wanted to ask you, too. So, how do they know how they were doing this? Were they on like some sort of scaffolding? Did they hang from the ceilings? Like what was, how were they uh, carving this? We can only speculate. I would imagine like, look at, you can see that they have like different blocks and you can even see the, look oh, at here, yeah. the, the, you see here is the division between. Do you think it was all done? Here. 
pre and then late like put into there somehow or no i have no idea and actually i should know i have a whole book on on the construction of the temple on the but this is a detail i, I have no idea how how they did this part in particular but but yeah I, basically what i wanted to do with the book was first of all to showcase these beautiful images with original colors but more than that what i wanted to do was to make sense of them because once you know the story behind them what i explained to you so they're beautiful on on their own but once you understand what they mean then they are spectacular they become spectacular and we're super zoomed in is there any rough idea like how how big in reality is like thoth right there in the middle how, how big is this okay, yeah so like like how big would thoth be right there you zoomed in like in 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 relativity to like you like if like is that like 10 inches okay. is it two feet is it uh, you know oh so so yeah so this is probably three meters from here to here so this is one meter two meters and three and a half meters probably like okay. this panel okay and then like like 17 meters from here to here oh okay so okay. they're gigantic yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. so in perspective like you just see like to put this is a tennis court so they're like fairly big right right, right. yeah that's why i was just curious so, how big each figure so this was is probably like yeah this is like well, like one and a half stories high or something like that if you could put them like vertically they're big they're taller than me right like if, you, if, I, if i was laying down here i would my body would be probably from here to here oh okay like that gotcha so yeah they're they're very big basically i guess you can they but have to be that big to have that level of like detail too uh, yeah, and especially at that height in order to make sense of it. But that's one of the complications, right? Like when you go there, these things, like when you're there, to see this is really hard for various reasons. Number one, is dark. Number two, is hot as hell. <laughs> and you're probably jet lag from coming to Egypt. Number three, people come to this temple and the temple is very big this is the first room in the temple so people spend 15 minutes in this room 20 minutes at most because the tour has to move on and go to like usually when people come yeah to i mean temple, I, do... aside from the holy of holies it's probably the most important part right yeah it, it's not that interesting that room well it is like the the, the walls are full of images so of the the statue and the boats that they used to carry the statue of the of the goddess Hathor and so on, but but they're just carved. There are no colors there. Uh, the most spectacular place of that temple, and that's why I, I, I decided to make this book about this, is the ceiling. I think this is one of the masterpieces of humanity. Mm, but it's not not many people know about it. And I mean, I, I, yeah, I love I love Egypt. I knew about the temple. I mean, we talked a little bit before about people think the stairs leading in from uh, Hathor and in the temple at Edfu are melted or something or uh, ero water erosion or something. It's just it's just wear and tear from sand and people walking through there all day, every day, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I I think so too. And and the other thing is that this temple, the the the, the stone, the rock that they use to make it is not very hard. It's is sandstone. So it's not that that the whole temple is made in granite or something like that. Is is a soft rock. Um, yeah, no, there's exa yeah, there's are. examples of that. Even like the Great Wall of China, like I mentioned before, there's like spots mm. where it's like super <laughs> eroded from people walking across it all day long. Mm -hmm. Correct. So, so yeah, so each of the panels, this is the panel of the moon, the, the cycles of the moon, which is the cycle of fertility, of human fertility as well, and the phases of the moon and so on. One I wanted to ask you actually really quick, because you mentioned Blue Lotus. Um, mm -hmm. Is the, the Blue Lotus, obviously it's got psychoactive, psychedelic properties. 
Um, mm-hmm. There's also some component of it that's, um, I don't even know, it's not like a, like a natural Viagra or something like that, you know? Um, I, I forget, you can look it up. But yeah, one it's of my, an aphrodisiac, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so supposedly there's some component of it that gets, you know, for sure the male, like you're saying, maybe the female too. But like, do you think that that's why it's connected with that? Or do you think that there's some other reason why that symbolism is so prevalent? I mean, obviously, again, it's got mind-altering properties, but do you think that it's that mixed with a fertility, or do you think that there's even some other thing beyond that? Right. So so there are two plants that are the most iconic plants in Egypt, and they show up in many depictions in many places. One is the lotus, and the other one is the papyrus. And those are the two most common, dep- commonly depicted plants in Egypt. Uh, the lotus, as I mentioned before, I know it in the mornings the, the flowers of the lotus open. So, so they saw that like as a, as a, the blossoming in the morning, like as the beginning of life, right? And so, so they're a symbol of of of, of life coming out, right? And and that's why, for example, in what what they call the the light bulb or dendra, that is a lotus. Yeah, and yeah, I then, think I got a picture of that. I can I'm pull up show that later. Let me, let me let me stop sharing here. Let's see here. Yep, yeah, there we go. Yeah. So you see the base. The base is a lotus, and then you have the serpent coming out of the lotus. That's the. Uh, uh, depiction of the 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 birth of the nile river the 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 serpent represents the river basically so 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 this is and and the river represents life obviously right in contrast to the desert and literally all life in egypt comes out of the nile because of the fertility of the nile Mm, so so these are the depiction of of the creation Right and and the serpent coming out of the lotus is that is the Nile coming like bringing life to Egypt. So that's that's what like the the accepted uh, interpretation of this is. Yeah, that's interesting. And then, like I said, there's obviously physical applications uh, from this that I'm sure they obviously knew about. Um, Absolutely, and there, there's a lot of images of, of on the walls of the temples of deities and and and, and priests and, and goddesses and so on smoking out of a pipe lotus, right? Like you, you can see that. Very interesting. In yeah, yeah, no, there's there's all sorts of things. Like obviously, you can see in some of the depictions, like an opium flower uh, or you know things like that and then i've even seen things that look like mushrooms but then people say those aren't mushrooms well they're clearly mushrooms i don't know again there's a lot of ambiguity in some of the you know reliefs so, and yeah it's, so. it's what i was saying before right like, like one thing is to be able to and i i don't read hieroglyphs but there is obviously a message that a name that comes here but then all the symbology of this is never explained anywhere so, so there are certain things where there may say somewhere, oh, the serpent that came out of the, uh, like every year the serpent comes out of the, of the lotus flower or whatever. And then you can correlate that to the river. But then when you look at, this is full of symbology everywhere, right? Like starting with, uh, I don't know, like the, the position of, look at this, this person or deity here. And then it has, this is usually the depiction of, of a star. Or, or a solar disk, and then the position of the hands and the way they're kneeling down. And, and then you look at this, every single position of their body and, and, and the crowns that they use and so on represents something. So a lot of that is lost here. We, I have no idea what it means, and most people are... I would say I mean, no one really if knows. If you go it's by like, YouTube, it, most people are going to think that's like a, a light bulb, you know. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean cuz no, I mean that's just that's what the that's yeah, it what looks like a light bulb. It kind of looks like a light bulb, but then you have, you know, the people that get wild with some of the speculations and it starts, you know, again, it's one of those things where I'm not <clears throat> um 
opposed to having fun and speculating and things like that. But to your mm-hmm. point, I really want to know. Like, I'm very interested in what the actual meaning Absolutely. of that is. Like, do you know, is there somebody that's like the you know, end all be all of Egyptology symbolism, or is there like a book that you know of or something? Cause I oh, know, yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. yeah. What, I, what I'm telling you, the, the explanation that I'm giving you about what this means is that's the canon today of, of what is the, the latest uh, knowledge on what Egyptologists think that this means. Uh, now going, going back to, to the, the idea, these are light bulbs that is so ludicrous for many reasons. Number one, this temple is from the time of the Romans, right? This is the time of Cleopatra and, and Caesar and Marcus Aurelius. So if there was such thing as electric, electric light at the time, we would kind of know about it, number one, because this is from time, this is not that old, right? Like this, well, Right. Then, well, that's when people are like, "Oh, Baghdad battery." But I mean, again, that's <laughs> it's just kind of a you're now you're now you're just taking leaps and bounds to other cultures, other things. You know, it's just correct. And then, and then the other thing is that a technology like electricity is not only that we have electricity; is that it shapes our society in deep ways. So, for example, the idea in New York City, where I am. The fact that we have skyscrapers is a product of the idea that we control energy and we can create elevators. Because you couldn't have buildings of twenty or ten or fifteen stories. No, or that's a great point. High yeah, great without, point. Without without elevators, right? Because no one would go up and down those things. So what that means is the architecture, and 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 then if you had light then you would have wiring on the walls because that hasn't changed. The most effective way to transmit electricity is through metal. And that's why we have wires and things like that, right? So so it's pervasive. Uh, technology is pervasive and it's everywhere. So for example, these people obviously knew how to read and write. And it's pervasive because it's all the walls in their in their buildings are covered with symbols. So a technology is something invasive that shapes society and shapes us and shapes our lives. So any kind of technology that you end up having shapes the way you function in society. And there are no indications anywhere. Right. That but to they, that point, though, so people are always like advanced ancient technology or whatever, you know, like. I agree with that if it's something from like the earth, like if they figured out a way to utilize like leverage in some way we're just not thinking about or um indigenous materials that we just haven't thought about as being included in the process or whatever the case may be that Mm -hmm. could be considered advanced technology so that's why i don't know why people get crazy with like oh they're diamond cutting power tools you know like there's just no evidence for that number one and number two to your point if that was prevalent back then or it was invasive within their culture you would see way more hallmarks of it you know and like none of those blocks are exactly cut on the great pyramid to like you know they're perfectly rectangular or square or anything like that so i agree i agree now there there are things that are hard to explain right like there's a lot of uh, precision on symmetries on statues and things like that and there's a lot of analysis, right? Like the Christopher Dunn has done a lot of that. And they're very compelling things when it comes to, for example, you look at the symmetry of a marble face that is like two meters tall or something. And, and then you look at the eyes and the eyes are symmetrical to the hundredth of an inch or whatever it is like that, right? You you wouldn't ballpark that right like you you have to have no that was like their da vinci that probably did that you know yeah but even da vinci right like like and and the other thing is that is interesting about precision right is you precision is a product of function like you you don't use precision unless you need it because it requires a high effort you see what i mean yeah yeah absolutely like if I, if I want to level something 
to the micrometer or whatever, right? Th there has to be a reason for doing that, otherwise I wouldn't do it. Uh, so so they're, they're kind of compelling ideas uh, uh, there that I, I don't disregard at, at face value, but their hypothesis, again, is, is only that, right? Like, and, and I'm open to, to suggestions, but, but their hypothesis. I think what both you and I are saying is just that you can't apply what our, ide our idea of what technology is to them or advanced to them because we've gone kind of a completely different route here, right? So... And, and then the other thing is like a place like this, as I mentioned before, this is, we have a lot of writing, right? By uh, Greeks and, and Romans uh, that live at the time of this temple, right? And, and even before, 300 years before the construction of this yeah. temple. Yeah. So, 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 we we don't ascribe, for example, to the Romans the idea they had electric light, right, or or uh, levitating powers on things, right? But we ascribe that to the Egyptians, which in this case they're contemporaneous at this time, uh, and it's fascinating. And I think the reason why we do that with the Egyptians and not with the Romans is that. We kind of know the history of Rome because it was written, and uh, we have all yeah. the philosophers and yeah. the big people. So, so it's not it's not such a big mystery as this because but, we don't forget how to read them, right? To that point, though, too, I think that if you were to extract some sort of mysterious thing from that, that I think that's why the Greeks would go to Egypt to learn, like the first what you would consider natural philosopher Thales went there and supposedly recorded and figured out mathematically the height of the pyramids based on, um, you know, the position of the sun or something like that. I forget. There's like a little story there, but, um, to that point, the Greeks used to go to Egypt to learn, you know, mathematics and, uh, you know, some of the more esoteric stuff and they would come back and then they would apply that to their own, society or life or whatever so that influence is heavy for sure but i think that that mystery school thing i think if you're looking for like mystery and stuff there's more in that regard in the mind and consciousness than there is in like again the application of building and things like that again not that it's not phenomenal it's obviously phenomenal it's artwork you know but mm -hmm. i just think in in terms of you know when people are looking for mystery i think that it lies more in us, the mind, the the you know the consciousness, the the mysteries of reality right. and things like that. If that makes sense. Now this is covering mystery, right? Like the, the for example, these these unquote light bulb is shrouded with mystery, right? Like we truly don't know what, like the the full extent of what this means, and for that extent, like uh, many of the things that we see, we don't comprehend them, and we we have kind of vague ideas of what they are, but that's the extent of it. And, and they're fascinating. They're mysteries on, on their own and, and they're incredible. Yeah, absolutely. What What's something that you, did you learn something um, through the process of doing this? Like something about the Egyptians or something, um, Something that you just wouldn't have expected or something like that? Mm. Yeah, I had an insight and I think this is a beautiful insight on, on, on Egypt that once once you, you understand that it's obvious, but it's, it's something fascinating and it's this idea. The idea is that to us, language is a utilitarian thing. We use language just to communicate, and, and that's it. Uh, and we live in a world today where meaning is kind of gone uh, because, like, the ideology today is that whereas speck of dust lost in a wing of a galaxy in a 
insignificant planet among billions of stars, among billions of galaxies, and we're just an axiom, a cosmic axiom. And that's what we are. And that's the ideology that we have to live who we are. Mm. Imagine for a second or for a moment that your language and the sounds of your language were the names of your gods. For example, Ra is the sun, right? It's the, the name that you use to, 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 to name the sun, but it's also the name of one of the major gods in, in Egypt. And imagine that every sound that you produce is the name of one of your gods. What do, that would mean is that any word that you utter is comprised by the names of the gods. So, so when I name something, the sound that I'm producing to name that is divine because it's comprised by essences, divine essences of the gods. If that was our language today, a table wouldn't be just a table, would have a divine aspect. Because the be name like God's is table. <laughs> right. Because the name is comprised by fundamental divine attributes that are the names. So when language is divine, then anything that you name is imbued with the divine essence. So all of the sudden, you don't live in a world made of cult objects and utilitarian objects. But anything that you can name, and by definition, that means anything is divine. So all of the sudden, you live in a world made out of meaning, in a world full of divinity. That, that's, that's beautiful. Yeah, that, that's a beautiful thought. And I mean, it's true. We live in a world where I think people are kind of reaching right now. They're looking for whatever, you know, religion's still there, but it's kind of not as prevalent or popular as it once was throughout history. So I think we're in a time where, you know, I can go back to the like Plato's dialogues where, you know, Socrates is talking about uh, the most dangerous man is the man with that believes in no higher power. And I think that that's kind of where... We that's are. Who we are now. That's who we are now, and it's scary. And I think that that's it's a reflection of what you're seeing out there. And I think that, to your point, um, it's looking back to like these people, and then even going back to language. I talked about altering our consciousness. Now you're talking about it and its importance in relation to spirituality and like an essence of, you know, who we are, or whatever. And I think that, I just think that. Um, you know, you can never go back and do it, you know, do what they did or whatever. But what we can do is look and see what they were doing and take the positive attributes of that or the things that we think there are like, you know, little kernels of truth or whatever. So that's why, like, what you're doing was awesome, man. This book's phenomenal. Again, I mean, you got to get this book. I, I don't really, I mean, I recommend books all the time. We have authors on, but this huge hardcover book, um, the imagery, the themes, the way you break things down in there. Um, dude, you did a great job. And I mean, you should, I know you said you took a lot of time, but you should be proud of yourself. Cause I think that that is a work of art. Thank you so much. It's a tribute to first and foremost, the thousands of souls that work on this temple and we don't know their names, but they left their legacy there and i think it's a tribute to them do you is this something that was like a one-time thing or do you plan on doing future books or projects or anything like that uh, this was a passion project and it's something that called me like, like making this book was a call that i had and i had to make it uh, and I'm always busy coming up with ideas and things, but I haven't come up with the next one yet. <laughs> but I'm sure it's going to come at some point. Oh, I'm sure. Do, I, I mean, how many times have you been to Egypt? To, to uh, Four times. Four times. Is, is it something you just, are you going to keep going back there? Is that something like you keep? Uh, probably, yeah. I would, yeah. yeah it's, it's a remarkable place, and there's so much to learn and, and see. Uh, 
yeah, I would, I would love to go. When back. you go there, do you do your own thing or do you do one of these tours or what do you do? I, I usually do private tours. Like, like so, so one thing that is interesting in, in Egypt is that you cannot wander on your own on these temples. You have to be accompanied by an Egyptian, which is very interesting. Uh, so it's not like you can just rent a car and just go to these places on your yeah. own. Yeah. And now can't you fly in right there to the Giza Plateau pretty much? Uh, so you can, this temple is like right in the middle of Egypt, like halfway through. So the closest place, like the closest uh, big city there uh, is uh, Luxor. So, so usually what happens is that you fly to Cairo and then you take a, you, you can go by boat or by flight. You can take a, an, an airplane, like 45 minutes, like 50 minute flight to Luxor. And then from there to this temple is like an hour again, uh, away by car north from Luxor. Interesting. Yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I would love to go at some point. Like I mentioned, I would love to see Egypt and Greece, uh, and go to some of those, you know, go to the Giza Plateau and Luxor and all those wonderful places as well as getting to Greece and going to, you know, check out, you know, Eleusis and different sites like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. You have, I have a two year old <laughs> and he's pretty much taking up most of my time right now, but I, hopefully maybe we can get away at some point. I'd love to bring him along too, you know, something that, uh, you'll remember. Yeah, not the best age to <laughs> call no, that's that's what I'm saying. I think maybe like you know a little bit older, but yeah, when they're like seven or eight, like he's like I went when my daughters were like 12 and 13, like for the first time. How, like how did that. they like it? Did they like it? Oh, yeah, they, yeah, they yeah. Loved it. that's cool. Hmm. Yeah, that's so cool. It's um. Cause I, I, he's only two now, but he knows like all the sea animals. So like anytime you go to like the aquarium or the zoo, you know, he like freaks out. So, um, that age is amazing. Yeah. Enjoy, yeah. enjoy him. <laughs> oh, I love him. He's, he's so smart already too. He's way smarter than I am. So, um, but, uh, yeah, man, we can start to wrap it up. I'd love to have you on again in the future though. It sounds like you're a wealth of knowledge on lots of different aspects and, Dude, this again. I can't praise this book enough. It's 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 an amazing book, and like I said, you should be proud. Uh, shout out to Inner Traditions who did a great job too, um, and Bob Breyer. I don't know if you know him. I'd love to have him on the show too. I uh, as I mentioned, his oh, great, yeah. his great courses was because you know I mentioned this off air, but like we've talked about some of the more esoteric and woo aspects of Egypt and things like that. And it's not that I don't like talking about this stuff, but I do really want to know the truth. And I feel like truth has some sort of causal line, you know, not always, but there's some sort of causal line there. Right. So, you know, you got to find, find that breadcrumb for possibly some sort of objectivity. And, um, anytime I see somebody doing that, which is something that you've done and, you know, a Bob Bre uh, Breyer or, you know, whoever else is out there doing that yeah. kind of stuff. Um, yeah. One, know. one of the most, the, the best things of writing this book is the, the friendships that I made along. One of them is Bob. Uh, we became good friends and, and he's such an interesting character and very generous with his time and knowledge and he was a big help. And, um, yeah, one thing, one thing, well, what you were saying before is that to me, the truth is self evident. So when something is true, it resonates and it, it cannot be complicated. And so, so when, when you find things that are awkward and, and complicated and full of layers and hard to understand and so on, they're usually not true. <laughs> truth is self evident. And if you cannot explain something to a five-year-old, then I don't think that that's something that Feynman uh, said, the, the physicist. Yeah, well, I've, I've, something to a child. yeah, I've thrown that around. It's like if you, I always butcher it too, but it's like if, um, if you can't 
describe something complex in simple terms to somebody who doesn't know what you're talking about, something along those lines, then you don't really right. understand it or something like right. that. And to me, yeah, when, 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 when you realize that something is true, it's self-evident and it becomes like, the why I didn't think about that before, like obviously. So, and, and finding those things is the most joyful thing in life, right? Like that's. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, uh, one thing I was going to ask you is kind of a weird question, but do you think that their consciousness or anything was altered from the fact that like the Nile flows from south to north kind of, you know, like it's the only river that does that. And they're this like very foreign in terms of like culture, even though there's other similar cultures from that time period that don't feel that way. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, do you think that there's something to that? Um, Cause they're, they built their consciousness around this river and this river is doing something completely different than any other river on the world in the world. Mm -hmm. mm, never thought of that. I, I have to to ponder all that. I, I never, never, never thought of that idea. But yeah, definitely their philosophy and their ideas and their myths and their legends and everything revolves around that river. Cool, cool. Is uh, one last question too? I'm uh, sorry. I just want to get a couple more. I just. Back yeah, anyway. no is there anything that is a miss like what's the biggest mystery to you in terms of like looking whether it be Giza or Lac Luxor like what is there one specific site or concept that you uh, find most mysterious yes I I find it really hard to believe that the pyramids were built in 20 years to me that's really hard to believe i find that hard to believe could... too I'm, I'm right there with you at the <clears throat> because I, yeah. the number and i'm gonna I'm probably butcher the numbers but i think the 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 great pyramid has something like 2.5 million blocks and each block is like five tons or ten tons it's something crazy and in order to build this in 20 years, which is the explanation today, the, the, the canonical explanation today is that they were built in 20 years. You have to, like if you do a math, then that means that you have to put one block in place every other minute for the 20 years straight. And that's with people that use like ropes and probably animals and uh, wood and to 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 do this so today with the technology that we have you couldn't accomplish that in, in that in that way so yeah no, i agree I, the the math that you broke down too i think that's what makes it mm -hmm. kind of very unrealistic is this around there, there is a around the fascinating clock fascinating image dude if there is this fascinating image that i saw somewhere that is a scale where you have the Great Pyramid on one, and then, I don't know, something like 20 or 30 or 50 Empire State buildings on the other, because weight-wise, that's what it takes, right? Like it's an unfamable number of Empire State buildings on one side, because those things are hollow, right? Like they're, they're, they have, they're empty, it's just, and, but the pyramid is massive. It's just, it's a massive structure. So, so, yeah, and, and when you're in front of it and you see a, that's a mountain, it's a, it's a man-made mountain, it's enormous. So this idea that was built in 20 years to me is like, I, I cannot, I, I, like you look at the, at the great cathedrals in, in Europe and it took some of them, they're built in 300 years, it takes 300 years to build them. And, and you see the amount of material that is in, in one of these cathedrals, it's like, probably a hundred or, or more or less of what is in, in the in the Great Pyramid. So I find it hard to believe that it was 20 years. Now, if it's more than 20 years, the problem, and, and that's where, where the trickle down effect is, is that if I'm building my own burial site and it takes more than 20 years, if it takes two centuries to build it or whatever it is, then it cannot be my burial site. Because, yeah, 
So obviously it cannot be. So and that's that's where the things start to get complicated. But that's something I I still don't have a good explanation of how you could do that in twenty years. Yeah, that's a that's a good mystery. I mean, because mm-hmm. I mean I don't know. I forget whose theory or time is that. Mark is it Lair Leonard or something like that? I know he's like one of the top. Yeah, actually, that's... the the best explanation today that you have is from a French guy. And Bob Breyer. Made yeah, I was going to say, I've seen that, that, that Jean-Pierre yes. Lubten guy or whatever. Yes, yes. And and, and they say that the, the pyramid was built from the inside out. And, and then basically the ramps that they use were used as part of the structure. Of yeah, the, the internal the, ramp the, theory. I think the, right. the at the end, the only takeaway was like something weird with the corners where they couldn't figure out like how they would turn those corners mm-hmm. a certain way or something like that. But still, that doesn't explain the twenty years. Like uh, to me, it's still a big mystery that that part, right? the time frame of building. Yeah, I mean, the first of all, to your point. So like, and then there's discrepancies over like how many people were actually living in that area, or like a workforce. And then we're now we're talking about skilled laborers during the the, the rainy seasons of the Nile, and you know the, that would have to that that wouldn't work then right because then those people would be busy farming or doing whatever during the non raising season so right. where were they getting this other workforce in that time period you know what i'm saying like right. that just doesn't oh. correct now to me is like building a structure like that like imagine we, we we don't have the technology today we just have ropes and 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 wood in order to do that i don't find it impossible to build a pyramid like if a society, our society tomorrow decided, oh, that's the project we want to work on. Uh, yeah, it's doable, but not in that time frame. To me, the problem is the 20 years. And in terms of like, dude, people would be fighting. <laughs> They'd be like, this this person didn't do this right or this isn't precise. <laughs> or, you know, like that's why we wouldn't get it done is because there was like a clear line of who's in charge right you have the pharaoh you have the vizier you have all the people all the way down the line the the architect the engineers you know and then you know you have the workforce so i think that there was like a more of a clear understanding of who you were or your role at least and now in society we all think we're the the pharaoh right isn't you know so. right and yeah like like the, the, probably the biggest projects we have today is dams right like like the hoover dam or things like that or the, the, the Aswan Dam, uh, but that's the extent of it. And, and we don't create things for posterity anymore. Like, yeah, I remember going to the, to the Hoover to Dam, out, the Hoover Dam outside Vegas. And that was probably in the U S the only thing I was like, Whoa, <laughs> you know, that was like man-made where I'm like, Whoa, this is crazy. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I can't, to your point, I can't really think of anything else. Um, I mean, I'm sure there's other things. I haven't been to like Mount Rushmore or anything like that. But but yeah, I just remember the Hoover Dam being like the only thing like man-made that I can think of like being in awe of this thing. Mm-hmm. But yeah, man, this has been super fun and productive. And I think people will get a kick out of this conversation. Again, if you haven't bought it or checked it out, dendra temple of time uh this thing's thick too um amazing images again i mean i read a lot of books i i i know i'll I'll keep saying it but i'm gonna i hope i'm gonna sell you some books here um the imagery is unbelievable but i read a lot of books you're not going to get this kind of quality this um, especially with something like ancient Egypt. The only thing I can think of that's similar that I have is the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which they make it you know, pretty crisp too. But that's the only thing I can really compare it to. Um, so I highly recommend you go check it out. I have the link down below. And you can go check out Jose's website down below as well. Um, is there anything else you wanted to plug? Uh, no. Thank you so much. And accolades to, to Inner Traditions again for the excellent work they made here and thank you so much for having me oh absolutely you're welcome back anytime like i said i we talked this is the kind of conversations i love having stuff we talk about all the time so uh thank you so much for sharing your research and your time and everything um and yeah if the best way to support 
uh, Mind Escape would just be click the link tree link down below. We've got Patreon. We've got merch stores. If you would like, you can leave us a nice review. We'd really appreciate that. Um, we have video episodes on Spotify. We do all of our episodes live on YouTube. Uh, and then we have video on Spotify, and we're on all podcast and audio platforms as well. So uh, I just want to thank you again. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think the next episode we have coming up will be Tuesday night at 10 o'clock. Um, I think I, uh, I have Tom Hatsis on, and we're going to be talking about uh, the witch's ointment and uh, medieval and ancient uh, psychedelic and entheogen use. So... All right, uh, we're going to wrap it up here. But again, we love everybody. Stay safe out there. Oh, one more thing. I've been trying to uh, get people to check out our documentary if you haven't already, As Within, So Without, From UFOs to DMT. It's kind of look at two different phenomenon from the standpoint of consciousness and what's happening during these experiences. So go check that out. I think we're going to probably be breaking it up into clips uh, as well at some point here soon in the future. So, But uh, I just want to say we love everybody. Stay safe out there, and we will catch you next time. Peace.